Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. Today we have our senior pastor in the studio with us. So glad you're turning in and tuning in to either the podcast or on YouTube. Tom, it's good to have you. Oh, it's always great to be here with you, Jay. It's been the first moments of my day on Valentine's Day with Tom Shirk. (laughs) (laughs) Happy Valentine's, Jay. Yeah, I hope you... uh, did everything you needed to do for Lucy there. Oh, we have a good understanding. <laughs> <laughs> that is dripped with we implications. Had a, we had a little conversation yesterday. We just said, let's not buy cards for each other. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's really fun. My kids are at the age where they really appreciate a card from parents. Mm-hmm. So we do more for them at this moment on Valentine's yeah, Day. Yeah, I'm going to reach out to my daughter today. Yeah, it's really cute. We... My kids are becoming modern kids. They got gift cards to Starbucks for Valentine's Day. Oh, (laughs) nice. Better than chocolate. Better than chocolate. Well, it's also in the church calendar, Ash Wednesday. Yes, it is. Which is a historic day that some churches have participated in, some have not. Mm -hmm. Christians for thousands of years have participated in it, for sure. You know, the first time Ash Wednesday was mentioned, Lent, I do not. The Council of the Nicene Creed, when that was written. Thank uh, you, Jay. How interesting is that? That is. Yeah. we Not a lot of definition was given, but it was a definition of preparing ourselves for Easter. Mm-hmm. And that's the most important, right? That's right. Easter is just right around the corner. It's We're stepping into the Easter season. Lent is sort of preparing your heart, mind, soul. You know what? Here's the thing. I love Lent because it is a great marker for me. In those weeks leading up to spring, where I'm excited about spring, baseball, golf. What else? (laughs) Yeah, all the things, right? Yeah. And then I reminded, oh, yeah, Easter is the most important. Yeah. Paul said, I delivered to you of first importance, Mm -hmm. Christ. Christ died, he was buried, he was raised again. That's the celebration of Easter, and so it's worthy to prepare our hearts in these next six weeks, just say, get ready. And uh, the, the disciplines of getting ready over the centuries practiced by Christians is praying a lot, uh, confessing our sins, fasting, saying no to something as a way of saying yes to God, and actually elevating our level of charity and giving to other people. So. Yeah. I hope we'll all prepare ourselves for Easter. We're really counting on the Lord to, um, you know, connect with a lot of people on Easter this year. So we were just talking offline. This is your 32nd year. Is this your 33rd Easter then? Mm. Or is it the 32nd Easter at Calvary? It's probably the 32nd Easter Sunday that I will have preached here at Calvary. The first years you were at Calvary, did you have to wear a tie and a suit on Easter Sunday? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was all right. Yeah. It was back. That was that was culturally appropriate at the time. Yeah. And uh, we did. Suit and tie. Yeah. What was special about those early years here at Calvary for Easter? Well. What do you remember well? Yeah. I just r- remember my own excitement of being in a position of preaching, you know, for the first time, a series of Easter's consecutively in my earliest years and uh you know it's the same story year after year so if you you approach easter and you have 32 years of preaching it's the same message and you wonder if well how do i make it more creative but you really don't have to make it creative you just have to tell the story and god works through the preaching of the resurrection of christ in the lives of people yeah but amazing mm -hmm. that's pretty big honor for preachers put their Preachers put pressure on themselves so they have to be creative and novel and different. Right. And, uh, you know, at the end, you don't really have to. You just have to trust the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the truth of the gospel, and uh, God works. Yeah. So with Easter coming this year, what are you excited about? We're going to be in the same series here, right? Questions yeah. Jesus asks. Right. And um, we're going to finish up that series mm-hmm. on Easter Sunday. Right. What are you sort of anticipating as we finish up this series? Well, one of the things I'm watching in our campuses is there are a lot of people coming back into church. Mm -hmm. 
And it's very obvious, uh, as I've talked to many of them on our campus here in Boulder, and I know it's happening in the other campuses too, is a lot of people coming into church who don't have the background, uh, wouldn't know what Lent is, and just they just haven't had that as part of their grow-up experience or uh, body of knowledge. And so they're new to the Bible, they're new to the reality of what it means to become a Christian, and our prayer is that as we study through the questions of Jesus, they'll really be drawn in and that there will be some salvations that will come as a result of that question on that Easter Sunday morning. I don't know if I should give a little uh, you know, teaser of what it yeah. is, but it's in um, John 11 and Lazarus who died and was raised, and uh, Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. Do you believe this? That's the question that we're going to look at that morning. Do you do you really believe? Man, I couldn't think of a better Easter weekend to invite your friends, families, neighbors mm-hmm. into hearing a, a message like that. Yeah, exactly. I hope I hope everybody at Calvary would just be thinking somebody I know needs to be at church on Easter, mm-hmm. and maybe the weeks before too. Yeah. <laughs> what do you find? It, you know, that reminds me. In, as people hear this, sometimes they're like, "Well, you guys get paid to invite people to church, right?" What are some of the like stumbling blocks for you even in inviting people to church? Some hesitations. Yeah. Well, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I actually have just in the last two months had a really beautiful experience with one of my neighbors who came seeking mm-hmm. and uh, invited him to church. And he's been coming for about two and a half months. It's been really beautiful. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, people think I have an agenda for yeah. them, yeah. or they know I'm a pastor, so they will go to the other side of the sidewalk yeah. <laughs> when they come by my house. But uh, no, no obstacles. It's just a normal course of conversation. Just say, have, I, I think maybe a question, you know, um, have you thought about going to church? Have you, what's going on in your life right now? Is there anything that I could pray for? Mm-hmm. That That's how I interacted with him because I could tell something was up, and uh, it's been great. That's really cool, Tom. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's hard to step out and to invite people to church. You're like, hopefully that we're not talking about money this week. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's things like those that go through my head, like, okay, this is the week I invite them. This is, these are the, the easier weeks, Easter, Christmas. Yeah. They might have some historical church knowledge and know that this is what they're going to expect that week. Yeah. Okay. But I just read a book, um, the great de-churching it's yeah. about people leaving the church and the predominant um, conclusion of that massive study is that most people who have left the church would come back if somebody invited them. Yeah, wow. I mean, it's really amazing. That is amazing. So I, I would love to just awaken everybody at Calvary to think that the majority of people who have left the church would come back if someone said, will you come with me? Mm. Um, and I think that's a great practice that we could do. Why don't you come to church and come on over, we'll have lunch together or whatever. Yeah. Maybe that would be too much, but come to church with me. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's amazing. I, I, I'm limited in my stories of these, these things here at Calvary, but I know that like Ruby and Lou Sharp got invited to church. Oh, like, did look they? at the implications of, of that, yeah. you know, generations, five yeah, generations exactly. worshiping yeah. here at Calvary. It's, yeah. it's amazing yeah. to think about. Yeah. It's a good reminder in this season. I, I didn't know we were going to go there. And, I and didn't the either. Party. Yeah, but just that we can be prayerful, watchful of the opportunities the Lord gives us. Yeah, I think everybody who's listening to this should think, you know, we don't want to be a consumer church where we just generate all this content for our members. Like we say, we're on a mission. Right. We we And then the world is in a hard place, so let's reach the world around us right now. Who Who is in your world that God wants to? to bring to Christ and yeah. you might be the vehicle that would get them there. And this series, like, what does Jesus say? It's a very interesting series. Like yeah. what, what are the questions Jesus is asking? And I think he wants to draw people in, um, more than we do. Yeah. So let's, let's get after it. Yeah. Son of man came to seek and save. That's right. Okay. So we're in the series and actually the first few weeks I was caught off guard just as we were in the, um, sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. You know, and those were a lot of the questions of Jesus come from. Yep. But I was like, oh, I can't believe we're just sort of residing here over a few weeks. And I just have enjoyed that, that sort of surprise. You know, I try to stay away if I'm not preaching to like, so that I can receive something on Sunday, be surprised, you know, just 
you, you know what I mean? Like just uh, excited that there's something I didn't know was happening. What were we talking about the Sunday? You mean I like that being in the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah, I think that's where in his teaching style, Jesus would say really salient truths in mm-hmm. in a beautiful way, and then ask a question. And the question was designed to bring people in and say, "What what do you think about where you are right. in relation to anxiety, in relation to the way you treat other people?" And uh, his questions just just had a way of doing that, drawing people in to reflect on their own life, which we all have to do. Right. You said in your monthly newsletter which comes out every first of the month, and you should read it, Calvary people. Yeah. But you said that Jesus asked over 300 questions, Yeah, which I thought was a very high number. Mm-hmm. And um, there's a really good couple of questions in the Sermon on the Mount. This week is about judging others. Mm-hmm. Now, as you prepared for this sort of section in Matthew 7, what are some things that really caught your attention, you know, even before you preached um, last week. Well, I know that this passage, uh, Matthew 7, 1 through 6, is one of the most misunderstood, misapplied, misused texts in all the Bible because it appears to give a command, don't ever judge any other person. Well, that fits beautifully in our cultural day today where people say, I- I'm my own. Um, none of your business what I do. Don't tell me what I should do. So uh, judge not, yeah. or you're going to be judged. And it's um, it's easy to hold up this text as a shield, say I'm beyond any evaluation or any assessment from anybody else. And that's not exactly what Jesus is saying there. So as, as we're going in, how do you relate this text that Jesus is teaching to what's going on in our world? Yeah, that's really good. What are, what are some texts in the... The scriptures that tell us to judge. Well, Sermon on the Mount. So you get to the Sermon on the Mount, and the very opening verses of chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount is 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. And verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, in order to make sure that I enter the kingdom of heaven, I've got to assess what are the Pharisees and the scribes, what's the what's the moral teaching of the day versus what does Jesus say? And all through the Sermon on the Mount, he says, uh, you've heard it said, this is what everybody's saying in the world, but I say to you, you've heard it said, but I say to you. Well, that requires a judgment. Uh, am I going to listen to what the world's saying? Am I going to listen to what Jesus is saying? And again, he says, you, you hypocrites, don't be like the Pharisees, don't be like this, be like this. Um, so again and again, and then chapter seven, verse 15, he says, beware of the false prophets. So how do you beware? Well, you have to be discerning. You have to make a judgment. You have to make a decision. Am I listening to this or listening to that? So, um, it's not as if we don't make judgments, but uh, what he's condemning there in chapter seven is a really fault finding kind of judgment that comes from a sense of superiority and pride that I'm holier than you and I will tell you what and I as if I know everything there is to know about you your circumstances every detail your motives and that's why I make a judgment about you that's the kind of judgment that Jesus is condemning there yeah so he uses a great illustration that has been talked about a lot Mm. but speck in a plank yep what are the differences and, you know, why why use sort of those, that sort of word picture to explain judgment? I think it's funny. You know, it's just funny. A, a speck is actually not a, a grain of dust. It's like a twig is what it means, uh, or a little sprig of wood. So it's not insignificant. It's mm-hmm. a deal. Mm-hmm. You have a twig in your eye, but I have a massive log, you yeah. know, a two-by-four, a plank in my own eye, and, and that was just... Uh, his colorful, beautiful teaching of an illustration that we tend to see people's faults, but never our own. And mm-hmm. we all have these blind spots. Yeah, I said I, I haven't seen my blind spots yet, but <laughs> I, I've heard most people have them. Yeah, it reminds me of the famous seminary professor says, "I know I'm wrong in some of my theology. However, I don't know where it is." Yeah, that's yeah. right. We yeah. don't. We don't know. Yeah. But Jesus' teaching is you actually, you need to really look at yourself and you need to be sure that you're not judging someone else with a great sense of superiority and a lack of awareness of what's going on in your own life. Yeah, how do you get that awareness? Well, 
you have other people in your life, you know, <laughs> who, who are helping you. You have the Holy Spirit. And you, you know, I, I think what's being condemned here is this sup- sense of superiority. So when Jesus says, by the same measure you will be judged, underscores that when Jesus says, judge not, or you'll be judged, for with the same measure that you judge, it'll be measured out to you. I think he's what he's underscoring is we are all going to be judged. Mm-hmm. And we're going to be judged by God, who actually does know everything about us. He knows our motives. He knows the circumstance. He knows all the details, and he's going to bring that kind of judgment to us. Right. And you're not God. So don't judge in the way that you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged by somebody who knows everything, and frankly, you don't know everything. So be careful about the way in which you judge someone. Yeah. And when you look at somebody else's faults, you you just have a tendency to not see what's going on in your own life. First, remove that. Mm-hmm. So I, I think before you weigh in on somebody else in a critical way, you, you just have to say, Lord, search my heart. What's going on in me? Is this the right time for me to weigh in and tell somebody how wrong they are? Yeah, I, I sort of think of the old adage of walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Yeah. Sort of as the idea there, Yeah, right? Just yeah. the understanding of maybe where they're at mm-hmm. and what what is really the burden yep. that's going on. Sure. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. What do you think is sort of as post sermon, what do you think people wrestle with, you know, as they have the conversations with you after church on Sunday and emails and follow up through yeah. the week? Yeah. Oh, I think it's um you, you know, there's th- there's two different kinds of people, I think. Mm-hmm. There's some people who are sort of their gift is criticism. Mm-hmm. They're good at it. Right. They love it. It's their spiritual gift. They want to tell you what's wrong. And, uh, you know, we, we've all had those people. I've had people like that. Ooh, I've had a few of them, you know, who just right. can't wait to get after me about something. And then there's other people who say, uh, you know, who am I? I'm not going to say anything. So we don't say anything. We never right. take a sense of responsibility to help our brother out because there really might be a speck in his eye. There really might be something that he's struggling with. And, you, you know, God might be asking you to come alongside and say, hey, can I help you with this? Uh, not judging you. I'm susceptible to the same things. Every temptation is common to man. I see this in your life. Um, I've wrestled with it. Can I walk with you on this way? So I, I think people are trying to figure out how do I apply judge not that you may not be judged? Do we just w- withdraw? No, you really do engage with people, but you have to do it in a self-aware, Holy Spirit-guided, humble way. And, and don't forget that you should be quick to hear, slow to speak. Right. You know, you might not have to say, point out every weakness that your pastor has. Right, right, right. Totally. Which are many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's easier to judge public figures. Sure. Then, because you don't actually have to know them to actually judge them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. You don't really know them. Right. I think that's one of the easiest ways to judge people. Yeah, so I just repeat, that's the heart of this uh, warning. It's like you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. So be careful what you say. You're going to be judged by actually a measure from somebody who does know everything. So, you know, judge not. Yeah. You you, you may not have to be so critical. It's interesting to me that Jesus talks about this and then his brother James in his own book talks about judgment. What does he say? Well... That's really good. I'll go to it real quick. It's James. It's like James 5. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. It's one of his teachings Mm -hmm. of judgment. And then earlier on in James 2.13, thank you, he says, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Right. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Sure. Goes back to sort of the... Even the Beatitudes, blessed are the merciful, for right. they will sh- show mercy. Right. They'll receive it. Yeah, they'll receive mercy. Right. Like, that's, I, I think it's it's interesting how the brother of Jesus picks up on this. Yeah. So. I'm sure he had a big log in his eye and no speck in Jesus' eye. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, y- you know, we, we said Sunday that judging has a tendency to make us feel a little bit up the chain. Oh, you totally. Know, a little that superior. Is, and that's the only reason I judge. And and uh 
you know, being merciful. So having a sense of superiority and being merciless, that's what's condemned. Mm -hmm. You're not superior. You're, you're equal. And if, if you don't show mercy, mercy won't be shown to you. Mm -hmm. In John chapter seven, verse 24, Jesus said, um, do not judge by appearances, but by right judgment, discerning judgment. Mm -hmm. And discernment is really the, is the right word. Like, it's it's not what's going on on the outside that you can see. You you don't know everything that's going on on the inside. So, mm-hmm. you can judge, but judge with right discernment, and that yeah. takes skill, knowledge, patience, restraint. Um, but but some people are really given to being critical and judgmental. Right. I think discernment is one of the highest calls of the Christian life. Mm-hmm. Like, and you know, discernment comes from we talked about this before, like whole counsel of God, yep. knowing all that God has said. That's right. It comes from prayer. Yeah. It comes from sitting before the Lord, mm-hmm. knowing our own motives, the wor- the hard work of knowing our own selves yep. uh, before. And also, because like you talk about the scriptures, and I know you love this. I love this. Like black and white scriptures are the best, right? Like don't do this, do this. But a lot of the Christian life is about discernment. Yeah. It's like, well, that's good, mm-hmm. but is it actually part of the kingdom of God right now or part of my story? You know what I mean? Yeah. I think knowing the whole counsel of God, and this is a perfect example that Jesus seems to be saying, judge not. Mm-hmm. And then all through the text, he's saying, well, you, you, should, you should make judgments. Um, don't believe this, believe that. Mm-hmm. And there are false prophets and reject them. And here's the gospel, follow that. Um, and then when you get into the rest of the New Testament letters, Paul's talking to churches, and right. the churches is where this happens all the time. So it happened in the first century, no surprise. It happens in our time that somebody wants to make a judgment about somebody else. And it, it, Paul said um, in Titus chapter 3 that you're going to have factious people, people who are contrary. Mm-hmm. They just want to cause trouble and fights. And you, you're to give them... One warning, two warnings, and after the second warning, have nothing more to do with them. Mm-hmm. Or people who cause divisions because of this very kind of judgmentalism, right. um, avoid them. Yeah. Don't have nothing more to do with them. And I think that lines up with you know that mysterious verse six of uh, chapter seven in Matthew, where he says, "Don't give the the holy things to the dogs, and don't cast your pearls before swine." Uh, why? Uh, because they're going to trample them under feet and they're going to come after you. Yeah, that's I, a, that's a funny verse. Is a that's a very strange verse. Well, it, it's this same same idea that mm. there are some people who repudiate the truth of Christ, mm. and they have nothing of interest with the things of God, and they're very contrary to anything. Well, we live in a world where there are a lot of people like that. Who, who uh, man, I can tell you, some of uh, the people I've connected with in our city who are really anti-Christ. Right. So they come after you. What do you do? Okay, well, shake the dust off your feet and say, uh, you know, you're... You know, Jesus said, your blood is on your head. You know, yeah, you you're make going this to be judged. Yeah, that's going to happen. But if you don't want it, I'm going to walk away and go where the gospel is received. Well, he, he uses two words that I think are very off-putting, dogs and pigs mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's also this story in the gospels where the, even a lady who wanted something from Jesus said, even the dogs get the scraps off the master's table. Yeah. And then, you know, you see the pigs in the Gospels that the evil spirits get thrown into and they throw themselves off the cliff. Yep. Like, those are very off-putting words throughout the Gospels. So what if what Jesus is doing is he's taking the most unlikely creature, character, and, um, you know, dogs were mostly scavengers mm-hmm. and, you know, not like domesticated animals for the most part that we enjoy and love and pigs were an unclean animal to any Jew. And so he takes the most offensive and just says the things of God, uh, to, to an unclean, uh, they don't fit. Right. And they're going to actually, Jesus says they'll turn and attack you. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't cast your pearls before them, move away, move on. That's making a judgment. Mm -hmm. It requires a judgment to say, 
We had a question at the end of the service. I, I asked if there were anybody who had questions. And somebody, You do that quite often. <laughs> it's fun. So some young man said, all right, so if we don't cast our pearls before swines, then how do, do you know, what is that? How does that link with going into all the world and preaching the gospel? I said, you just, you just go and preach the gospel. If somebody rejects it, move on, you know, move on to someone else. Cause there are, there are people who are going to be very, um, against animus to the things of Christ and some who are searching for it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of go now we're, we're, we're in these questions of Jesus. What do you think out of all these weeks is going to be the hardest question to answer? Mm. Think about sort of the, the sermon series coming up. What in your mind you're like, oh, this is going to be a hard one. I don't know, Jay. I love them all. I mean, mm-hmm. to be honest with you, the anxiety question that we did, why are you anxious? Mm-hmm. That, that's a hard question because there's a lot of anxiety in our world. I mean, I think our, our, our culture right now um, works to keep the population anxious. Mm-hmm. I think there's a campaign to keep Americans anxious. Mm. You know, just think of all the bombardment of everything. That, that is a that is a huge thing, and most people wrestle with anxiety. Right. Um, um, we know what it is to feel worried about the future. You just list all the things that we're facing. That that was a hard. That's a hard one. Wow. But so you got the first one done. I got the first one done. But <laughs> but you know, I I love them because they're all they're all po- just powerful. With Jesus connecting with people, and some of his questions are confrontive some of them leave a little sting and some of them are so consoling and that's just the way jesus always was oh so good thanks tom for being with us today we done already yeah man oh that was fun yeah thank you i thanks for your time thanks for leading our congregations our our church and um excited for the easter season with you yeah me too calvary let's stay prayerful thankful to the lord on the behalf of all the godly people he's put in our lives that you would join us in prayer over the next six weeks as we prepare for easter weekend think about those people that you need in your life to invite to that easter message coming very soon march 31st this year let me leave you with sort of the psalmist tells us today in our wednesday no matter where you find yourself at if you're on the road, getting to work, coming home, tuning in to what Calvary is doing this week, Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Join me as we bless the Lord together this week, and we look forward to seeing you very soon here at Calvary.